say, he basically says, any learned layperson would say. Okay? So in other words, you know, you really ought to pay attention to this, Pope, because anyone's going to ask these questions. This unbridled preaching of indulgences makes it difficult even for learned men to rescue the reverence which is due the Pope from slander or from the shrewd questions of the laity. Again, understand, the theses were posted for a public debate among theologians and students and professors and so on. They were sent to Albrecht because he wanted the church to know about it, knowing that Albrecht would forward this to Rome. Okay? Because, of course, the Pope is being scandalized in this whole thing. Right? Such as, why does not the Pope empty purgatory for the sake of holy love and the dire need of the souls that are there if he redeems an infinite number of souls for the sake of miserable money with which to build a church. The former reason would be most just, the latter is most trivial. <coughs> the question is, why does not the Pope empty purgatory for the sake of holy love and the desire and the dire need of the souls that are there? If he has that power, why doesn't he just do that? Good question. Um, to repress these very sharp arguments of the laity by force alone, and not to resolve them by giving reasons, is to expose the church and the pope to the ridicule of their enemies, and to make Christians unhappy. <laughs> right. So what he puts as his confutation, that is what the opponents will say, is basically, anybody who thinks about this is going to ask these questions. So, you need to answer these questions. You, the hearer, Ultimately, you, the Pope, need to answer these questions. Okay. And then the last part of the theses is the peroration, theses 92 and 95. Away then with all those prophets who say to the people of Christ, peace, peace, and there is no peace. From Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14. Blessed be all those prophets who say to the people of Christ, cross, cross, and there is no cross. What does that mean? If you say, peace, peace, but there is no peace, that's a horrible thing. You're telling people, oh, be at peace, everything's fine. No, it's not fine. All right? Better that you say to people, turn to the cross or experience the cross even when you're not experiencing difficulty. All right? Cross, cross when there is no cross. So he ends that Christians should be exhorted to be diligent in following Christ their head through penalties, death, and hell. Does this sound like a, a theology of glory? <laughs> told you last week that Lutheran theology is a theology of the cross, not a theology of glory. So if what you're looking for is, I'll be a Christian, so my life will be good. There's no promise of that. I will follow Christ so that everyone will love me. I will follow Christ so that I thrive financially. I will follow Christ so that you put in whatever you want to put. That's not the promise. The promise is that Jesus will not leave us or forsake us, that he will be there in the dark times as well as in the light times, that we will maybe experience the most profoundly in the darkness. All right? So we are exhorted to follow Christ through penalties, death, and hell. Wherever he leads us, we're called to follow, and thus be confident of entering into heaven through many tribulations rather than through the false security of peace. All right. You know, the sort of notion, again, that to follow Jesus is easy is something we get lulled into as American Christians and probably Northern European Christians as well, which is probably part of why the church struggles in the Northern Hemisphere because what we've really bought into is kind of an American religion in this country of, well, hey, you know, God owes us. I heard a little of that rhetoric the other day in the inauguration. Yes. about how God has chosen this country. God owes it to us, in essence. God will make us great. In the uh, Second World War, when the uh, German soldiers went to battle, they had belt buckles. What did it say in their belt buckles? God with us. God with us. We are fighting God's cause. What did we say as we opposed them? We are fighting against tyranny. We are fighting in behalf of God. In the Civil War, the preachers on North and South 
justified the cause on the basis of Scripture. Proof texting Scripture to justify what they were doing. Abraham Lincoln was asked the question, is God on the side of the North? And he said, it matters less whose side God is on, but rather whether we are on God's side. Mm -hmm. Do we follow God or do we follow the state? And by the way, and this may be a touchy subject, I don't know, uh, for someone in this room, we do not have American flags in the church. You probably grew up in churches where there was an American flag and a Christian flag. This, by the way, this flag called the Christian flag is actually the Brooklyn Sunday School, Protestant Sunday School flag. Because they used to have parades in, in Brooklyn in every parish, every Catholic parish had their flag. And the Protestants had no flag, so someone made this flag, and so it's the Protestant Brooklyn Sunday School parade flag. <laughs> now called the Christian flag. All right. But we don't put, we choose not to put flags in the church because when we come into the church, it's not about the nation. Even though we pray for the nation, we want the best for our nation. We don't see things all the same way about our nation. It's about God. We have come here to worship a God who is not shaped by the nation, should not be, a God who is above every nation, a God who is eternal when every nation will rise and fall. Right? So any kind of false security that is, well, I'm a Christian and everything is good because God bless America. I mean, I want God to bless America and Rwanda and you name it, all right? But notice that the Christian church is growing immensely, and the Lutheran church among those, in the third world. South America, Africa, where people are under persecution. And they realize that to follow Christ means something. It costs something. And the more we understand that ourselves, the better disciples we'll be. Because to be a Christian is to take on a sign. I've often thought, wouldn't it be great if when you baptized someone and you marked them with the oil, that cross was indelible on their forehead, and they had to live their life uh, bearing the cross, <laughs> all right? Because to be a Christian is to bear the cross, but it's also to live your life under the protection of the cross, which is an amazing thing. So, this brings us back to the first thesis. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he will the entire life of believers to be one of repentance because only in putting ourselves in God's hands do we discover that peace and joy that God intends for us. So these are the theses, all right? 95 of these things posted, sent around. And I guess the question is, how did these spark the Reformation? Because if I give you a copy of it and ask you just to read them, chances are you're going to say, well, those are a little bit esoteric. Okay. There they are. All right. But it sparked a reformation. Why? Because they spoke to something that was a concern for people. How am I right with God? Does this make sense that I somehow buy my way out? Maybe Luther's right. That it's all about grace. And, yeah, they started thinking for themselves. And again, Luther came at the time, the printing press had been around for about 50 years when he was born. And so what he wrote, instead of being simply in Wittenberg, was spread. And you know, the piece that he wrote, there was a, a uh, rebuttal to what he wrote, written by one of Albrecht's people. And uh, it did not do well in terms of selling, everything Luther wrote sold like hotcakes. Because he touched the nerve of righteousness, of God's grace and mercy, as opposed to some kind of scheme, some kind of plan in which you simply paid and hoped. Because let's face this, if you're dealing, and I think this is true across the board, if you're dealing with any kind of scheme, I don't care what it is, if your salvation depends on your doing anything, how will you know for sure you've done enough? How will you ever know? I don't care how much good you do, there are those dark moments when you think about those things that were not righteous and good. And what points do they have? How does the scale balance? How do you know for sure? I think about uh, Jehovah's Witnesses who go door to door. You know, if you uh, invite them in to talk to them, 
they get points for that. If you uh, slam the door in their face, they've been persecuted for the, the faith, they get points for that too. Because they're out there earning their way to, to heaven. Uh, there's this am amazing thing, um, you know, in Jehovah's Witness theology, there are 144,000 elect who get to be ultimately in the celestial kingdom with God. Hmm. They had a gathering in Yankee Stadium back in the 60s, and 153,000 people showed up. <laughs> <laughs> Which meant there were 9,000 not elect in that group. Okay. Then they thought, well, those are the other sheep. And they get to be in the terrestrial kingdom with Jesus, who isn't God, in their understanding. All right. The amazing thing about that is, if there are 144,000 who get to be in the best place, do you want to be one of those? For all eternity? Best food, best accommodations for all eternity, all right? So you work hard. Well, what if the 144,000th person was my mother? Well, I want to get in. I don't even bump my mom out. <laughs> that doesn't sound very good, does it? <laughs> but how would I ever know I've done enough because someone else may do better than I did? As long as your scheme in any sense, dealing with indulgences or any other thing, is that you have to earn it, you will never be sure you've got it. Which is why the gospel is so incredibly wonderful and why living a life of repentance, knowing there but for the grace of God go I, what do I trust? And I trust only in God's promise. Yes? I'm just curious with that number, are there still spaces available or do you bump them out? <laughs> no, you, have to bump out. <laughs> you have to bump them out to get them. Oh, okay. So yeah. you get bumped. Yeah, so you're never secure. See? I mean, you'll always be in heaven, but you may be in that terrestrial part where they cater for McDonald's <laughs> for all eternity. Yes? Um, in those days, um, Jesus said, you know, congregations wasn't able to read the Bible, right? That's correct. So, but still, um, I'm sure like a lot of people was able to study and then read the Bible. And my question is, why only uh, Ruth was able to understand that? He, he wasn't the only one. Okay? There were others as well who were saying similar things. Luther happened to be the right kind of person with the right kind of uh, education. education and mindset and conviction and stubbornness to say it. A hundred years before Luther, a man named John Huss from Bohemia had said similar things. He was burned at the stake by the church for heresy. Okay. Luther, in 1521, of course, was declared an outlaw when he refused to recant his writings and a heretic. All right. So we as Lutherans are followers of heretic. Until recently. And he also translated the Bible into German. Yes. As before or after. Because, I mean, that would have been a big impact on the people. Right. That was after 1521 when he was declared a heretic and an outlaw. On his way back to Wittenberg, he was kidnapped by his friends, taken to the Wartburg Castle for his safety, and while there he translated the Bible into German. And put the, put the order of worship in German, in German mass, so that people could worship and read and study in their own language. And again, books were now possible because of the printing press. So Luther came at the right time. So like, the people who made the indulgence and that kind of thing, um, they didn't read the Bible? Um, yeah. <laughs> Some of them did, yes. You know, people in Rome, I mean, the Pope is the one who published this. Well, he obviously had read scripture, and as had his, his inner circle and so on. But they, again, in, the, in traditional Catholic understanding, there is weight given obviously to the scripture, but also to, to tradition. Okay? And so you're always interpreting the scripture by the tradition of the church. And, so they, and, don't be, they didn't believe the Bible was the word of God? Oh, no, they did. They did. So but again, they, it's easy to misread or to misinterpret or to begin to kind of wander away, all right? It's kind of like the, uh, the parable of the lost sheep. What's always struck me is sheep don't choose to get lost. They nibble themselves lost, okay? Mm -hmm. 
And I think that's what happens sometimes in the church as well, is that we kind of go off this little tangent that isn't really much of anything, and then that kind of leads to this, and, and after a while we've kind of gone off track. Because any one of us, any church, can ultimately wind up giving people the notion that it is by your faithfulness, by your coming to the church every Sunday, that you are saved. You ought to be in church every Sunday as a response to the grace of God. But coming to church doesn't gain you any points. Okay? It gives you a chance to praise God. We are saved purely by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Nothing else. And that's the one thing you can count on because it's God's promise. Yes? Uh, you, just, uh, you were going to say until recently regarding Luther being regarded as a parent. Yes. Yeah, recently the, uh, the Catholic Church has acknowledged that uh, actually Luther was right in things he said. Not everything he said, but in some things he said. And we have, in 1999, there was a joint declaration on the doctrine of justification signed by Lutherans and Catholics where we basically say, you know, we do agree about what it is that is the basis for justification. It is what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And so the... Um, heresy label has been lifted off of Luther officially. Okay, uh, Luther still said some horrible things, <laughs> and we've confessed those things as well. All right? But we're in a different day now than we were in the 16th century in terms of Lutheran and Roman Catholic dialogues and all, and have come to realize that we have more in common than that which separates us. We still have doctrinal differences, there's no question, and the place it shows itself most pointedly is in the unwillingness of the Catholic Church to allow Lutherans to commune in the Catholic Church in most cases. All right. If you uh, acknowledge you're a Lutheran or a Protestant or not a non-Catholic, you are often not welcome. All right. There are still Lutheran churches that do the same. Senate. And especially Wisconsin Synod. But most Lutherans have the sense of we are have open communion. That is, if you believe Jesus is present in the bread and wine, you're welcome to come. Well, I have a question about that. I have two sons. One's at Moody right now. Um, he was a missionary for many years. Mm -hmm. And another son who attended ABF. And so, and I have a son here. So, you know, the difference between believing during communion that you know, the bread and the wine become the body and, and blood mm -hmm. of Christ, it, and whether or not it does not, that's a big discussion, and I think that's why some <laughs> churches don't allow. Right. We will, I'm going to put that one off, because that's the next class I'm going to teach, is on Holy Communion, and what Luther had to say about it, and so on. So you, you're going to have to wait a little bit, because before <laughs> that, we're going to have Pastor Steve next week, and his father... Maybe his mother, too. Bill might be involved in that. Helping us talk about how, how Luther read the, the scriptures and his favorite books and his not-so-favorite books and all that kind of thing. I think it'll be a really interesting class. Uh, then we're going to have some classes. Uh, Arne Schwartz is going to do one on Luther's time, what was going on historically at that time, other movements and so on. Um, Pastor Jack Ledbetter is going to do a couple of classes on Luther and family and so on, and, uh, and then we're going to get into the, uh, the worship side of, of the book. And again, if you uh, read in these, some of the things we're talking about obviously are in here. If you don't have a copy, these are still available. Um, but you'll notice that it starts out with the historical stuff, it gets into the worship piece, it gets into other aspects. So we're going to generally follow that that regression. It will be listed every week in the newsletter what's coming the next two weeks so that you can plan for that. But we will spend a session on baptism, we'll spend a session on communion, and that will be the next one that I teach. So, yes? On uh, next Monday, January 30th at CLU, uh, our Bishop Guy Irwin is speaking on this subject, Lutherans and Catholics, um, at 7 o'clock, and it's open to the public. So. Right. He's, uh, he is, by the way, a Luther scholar, and uh, he is doing what's called the Reformation Roadshow, where he's going to different churches around the Synod. He will be here on, I don't remember the date, I think it's in May, and uh, any one of those sessions is open to anyone who wants to go to them, and he deals with different aspects of the Reformation. So again, that's Monday the 30th. 30th. And, uh, and one other thing, there's a... Uh, you, 
familiar with Rick Steves, the uh, travel person that's on NPR, has a travel show and so on, and he's a Lutheran, and he had been asked to do a historical perspective of Luther's time, and he uh, takes through Germany, and it, it's a, about a 40-minute movie, <coughs> I think, and, uh, and we have that uh, on DVD, so if, uh, yeah, I, there I may be a chance for the group or yeah, individuals. I think we're, we're planning, awesome. not on a Sunday morning, but at a separate time, to offer a showing of that. Oh, also, good. the Luther film uh, that was done a number of years ago with uh, I don't Joseph Fiennes, is it? Yeah. 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 And then uh, we may even dredge out the uh, 1956 black and white film of Martin Luther that was two reels long, two big reels long. It's actually really cool old film. So throughout the year, we'll give you some opportunities to see any of those if you'd like to, because it's really interesting to, to see it visually and uh, see how different people portray that. So uh, I guess that is it for today. Uh, Thank time. you. And, uh, but I, I just think it's such fascinating stuff. It is. Thank you. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Hello. Still going. Ooh, better be careful what I say standing right there. <laughs>